I am Justin Cosby. I was beaten and detained by the police. Hidden from my parents, this is my story. At the beginning of the day, we were just, we were starting in Daily Plaza, marching through. And I remember the first thing that I saw that was maybe any indication of like the police um, stepping out of line. I'm not sure what, what happened here, but it was like six of them chasing like one person through a crowd and people were trying to like get them away from them. But the, the vast, vast majority of the crowd, there were thousands of people and thousands were peaceful. I know throughout the day, as the police increased like their methods for dispersing crowds, uh, it created more of like uh, an atmosphere of just being fed up. I saw that this girl was on the side of the street and she had just been maced by the police and there was a crowd of pizza protesters in front of the police and the police were macing people. And so I had a water gun in my hands and I ran in front of the police line and I sprayed them with water so that they wouldn't like, I was hoping that they wouldn't like mace anybody because they had, would have water on their helmets and they wouldn't be able to accurately see who are they trying to mace. But instead, one of them just maced a random person in the crowd and the whole crowd dispersed. He sprayed this one police officer and one police officer just completely lost it. He just lost his temper. He's just sprinted after Justin full speed. And once he started sprinting, all his other I'm gonna just say homies, because that's basically what I seen is gang. They just jumped in and they just like it was like a full uh, line of police officers running down the street come to get Justin. And so I had to take a back alleyway to come around and meet them again. And when I came back around, it was like 20 police officers that had just stockpiled on this man. So the first time they had me on the ground, um, the officer told me to stop resisting arrest. I told them a bunch of times that I wasn't resisting, and like. Because he kept like ignoring what I was saying when I said I'm not resisting, I even went my I even let my body go completely limp at one point just so he could just put my hands behind my back and just you know arrest me. But he didn't do that. He just kept on holding me on the ground, and that was when I was kind of panicking because I was just like, well, how long is he gonna keep me there? Like, what's gonna happen? Because they're kicking him, they're beating him. I thought he was unconscious when I first saw him. It scared the shit out of me because I thought he was unconscious. And they were carrying him. I could have sworn I thought I saw blood coming from his face somehow. The officer held my hand in front of me. He held my right hand down on the ground in front of me while he told me to put my hands behind my back. And it got to the point where I had to like struggle to move my hand behind my back because he wouldn't just let me move my hand behind my back. I was just like, yo, they carry him. They, they He's unconscious. Y'all can let him go, this and that, yada, yada, yada. And we get to the middle of Grand Avenue and they just, they just, throw him to the ground and they kneel on him and they're just holding him down. I'm looking like this is exactly what we were marching for. You know, y'all can't just use excessive force. He's already unconscious. There's no reason to put him on the ground, beat on him. So he was like restricting my, some of my airflow and I had been running, so I was really tired and there was another officer who came over and hit me on the back of the batons and stood on my legs and things like that. And so uh, it's a combination of all those things. I couldn't get up right away and told me to get up. And that was when they picked me up and just like carried me like a duffel bag down the street. Um, th and at some point, I think I felt, I think I passed out, and my zip cuff, my hand fell out of my zip cuff. And that was when they threw me on the ground again, and they stood on my legs while another officer hit me. It, it was kind of hard to keep track of everything that was happening. I just know that somebody was hitting me, like on my back, because my face was impressed into the ground the whole time. But it, I know somebody was hitting me on my on the back of my leg, somebody was standing on me. I was like, my blood flow was like really hindered. And then another officer who I actually saw, he came over, stepped on my face. And um, when they told me to put my hands behind my back again, he stepped, he went over and stepped on my hand so I could move my hand behind my back. Um, and then when they had my hand behind my back, he took out his baton 
and then he hit me in the head with it repeatedly. Like you always see stuff like this on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. But you never think it's gonna happen to someone close to you, and then you'll get to see it like happen, like right then and there. It was, um, it was just really, it was disgusting. It was really sad to see. It just, it was just, I, it's hard to describe it. It's just really, I nobody, nobody should have to see that in person. Oh man, as I saw it, that scared the shit out of me. Because you hear about it all the time on TV. You hear about it on TV, on social media, on Twitter, all this and that. And but you never see it. And I saw my one of my best friends get abducted by the police, and like they were taking him away. I was asking police officers where y'all taking him. I was asking them to, you know, for any hints. Nobody was telling me. If there was a group of guys and you sprayed them with water, and they responded by throwing you on the ground. Uh, kicking your ass, then taking you away from like the area that you're in without your phone or any, any way to contact your family. They don't even let you get into contact with your family 27 hours. They would they would be like on a national manhunt for those people. You know that would, that would be like a huge federal crime. And so the fact that the police did it doesn't really make it that much different. The the way that they treated him for shooting a, some water in their faces wasn't wasn't fair at all i mean it's really sad to see how that's how you react and that's how you protect and serve your citizens that's not it's, it's just it's really it's it's bad it's really bad uh first of all spraying water on a police officer is never is never an excuse for the police officers to abuse it in any uh margin or any proportion but I also saw people getting let go. They were throwing things at police officers. They were throwing boards and billboards and rocks and it's just a whole bunch of like, it was a lot more dangerous stuff being thrown and done to the police officers and they were letting it go. They were cool with it. But they see this black kid with dreads, excuse my friends, they, they see this black kid with dreads running in front of them spraying water and they chase him down the street. I'm like, I didn't water it didn't, didn't hurt you. And I even have a video in there. I was asking them, I'm like, all this over some water because it, it just seemed ridiculous to me. It was a criminal way to respond, actually. It was just a, like, just because they have a badge does not authorize them to use excessive force. Um, more times than not, um, the badge protects them. If you do something like that on a regular day, if you're a regular person, that would not fly, you'd be in jail. Um, it's really, like, I can do whatever I want and you can't do anything about it. What the police badge means to me is that you've now given this civilian power over another civilian. And power is, is a dead. Historically, throughout time, power has always been a dangerous thing because those who don't know how to use it. It's just an abuse of power. Um, that badge gives them some sort of like invulnerability, like they're not touchable or something. And a lot of a lot of the times the court system and the judicial system they treat them that way you have the license to kill somebody if you deem it fit and rarely are they really prosecuted a few times that they are prosecuted you know it's publicized but you're giving somebody power i don't think anybody should ever have that power so what the police badge means to me is a police badge is as long as people are allowed to have that power over somebody it's an active proponent of oppression and an active proponent of suppression it's like if you don't stand up for everybody else who's being oppressed now, then when something happens like this to you, who's gonna stand up for you? We keep hearing about these things happening every single year and it's so many different cases. This is the point where not even every case like just makes national news and gets coverage all the time, which is outrageous. The fact that it's a person that we trust to protect us. We've always had been conditioned to the fact where if something's going wrong, who do we run to? We run to the police. You always run to the police, you run to law enforcement, you run to gov the government because this is who you've been conditioned to believe is going to fix the problems. So now what, who do you run to when who you're, who's being conditioned to fix the problems is part of the problem? They're not going to fix themselves. They're not going to fix their own problem. Now we have to look into ourselves. It's worse definitely when it happens to someone, like when it happens to one of yours because it just it reignites that feeling of no one's disconnected from it. No one's too far to be touched by it. Like, it can happen to anybody. I mean, you can't really look at anything else besides that, and it'll tell you, like, 
this is this is real like you know what I'm saying this is real they kept on telling me that like, they couldn't really they couldn't uh, release my zip ties because my arresting officer wasn't there and he just kept saying that over and over again because I was really complaining about how tight they were and I had every right to because I needed medical attention, like an ENT had to come over. So for about the first like 14 hours, I couldn't get any food or water because no matter how much I begged, the police would pretty much just ignore me and they would tell me to contact my arresting officer. But the thing was my arresting officer wasn't even at the precinct. Um, and if you asked, and like there was no way to ask for your arresting officer, they didn't tell you his name. It's not like your arresting officer would just like pin you on the ground and say, by the way, my badge number is 01924, asshole. So it's like there was, there was no way to know who your arresting officer was and every time you asked for anything, they would tell you to uh, contact your arresting officer. I think it wasn't until about like four hours in, I was even able to use the bathroom because uh, a sergeant came over and I asked him to use the bathroom. I was just trying to be like really respectful to them so they wouldn't have any reason to say no. I just, I just actually used the bathroom. After like three hours of like some of them saying no, one of them finally said yeah, he took me to the bathroom and right after that he took me back to the uh, holding cell. And then it was about another, like, it was a really long time before I actually had like, access to water. I, di I didn't get access to water until I was put in the last building cell that I was in from, I want to say about 9 a.m. to 3 a.m. So from 9 p.m. to 9, to 9 or 10 a.m., I didn't have any access to food or water. I tried to call my phone so that I could see where it was, so that, I could, that was where I was going to go after I got released. That was, but I didn't even get a phone call until 11 o'clock on Sunday night. And I had been begging for one since about 6 o'clock Sunday night. Um, I was arrested for, for reference at 8.40 on Saturday night. So it was about 27 hours before I got even a phone call after begging for it for like a five hours. And then the fact that police were joking around about my name and they were saying that I was in the back in the basement tied up telling jokes. Justin Cosby. Jay Justin Cosby. Just, it's a Justin Cosby. The UFC guy? It's going to be a Justin he's Cosby. He's in Chicago? Where did he come from? When did he come? It's going to be a Justin Cosby. Justin Gagey. Have you seen him? Cos Chris, Chris, Bill Cosby? Have you seen him at all? I haven't seen anything. I I'm sitting at a desk. Has anybody heard any word of him at all? Or anything? I don't know. You can find someone else. Just find to call someone else because I don't know anything about this stuff. But aren't you a police force or? No, we're, 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 this is a true one. People were calling and the guys were joking on the phone like, oh yeah, we got him in the basement right now, tied up. Or we got him down here telling jokes and stuff like that. Like, you know, just kind of disturbing things that, that you wouldn't tell to someone who's looking for their loved one. I, I personally called um, one time. I think it was, it was at the first precinct, the one that I called which is where he ended up being. Or I was like, do you know the whereabouts? I'm a friend of Justin Cosby. Do you know if he's there or if you don't, or if he's not there, where's his whereabouts? And then he just sort of like was jokingly like laughing at me, like, oh, you don't really know him. And then questioning everything I was saying. I got people calling the precincts on top of me personally calling the precinct. Cause you know, I call first precinct. First thing they tell us he's not here check around the hospitals, this and that. I'm like, that's not good enough. We were told by your officer that he was coming to the first precinct. So somebody's gotta explain for this. So I got people on top of people on top of people calling the first precinct. Okay, so the first thing that we tried to do once we found out Justin was missing was actually go to all the precincts. We called the 18th precinct, which was where they first told us that he was being held. They gave us the run around, they told us they didn't have it. After that, me and my older brother, we were driving around, we went to all the precincts that were in the near north area, like anywhere they could have possibly taken them. We went to all of them, there were about five. I mean, at that point, we were just basically getting the run around from the precinct. As the day progressed, they started to see it more as a joke. Uh, they started telling us stuff like he's tied up in the basement or they set up a voicemail for him and they uh, asked, one of my friends, they asked her if she was his girlfriend and just a bunch of immature stuff. Like you would think that we were dealing with 12 year olds instead of, you know, people appointed to protect the general public. I don't think they understand like the trauma that they put people through when they just joke around and take things as a game.
it's really it's really more than serious. My mom told me to hang up the phone because I was like the brick of tears because it's like that's not a person's life is not something to joke about and blatantly lie about on that massive scale. The thing about when the police just arrest people just like who are standing there is that it's scary for one thing. Um, you you don't know why the person's being arrested. They don't tell you why you're being arrested. So it's basically like you don't know what's gonna happen to you. Seeing the police officers take people away and abduct people left and right in these crowds, it, op it opens my eyes um, mostly to what it is I imagine my grandparents saw. Uh, I imagine Black Panthers and civil rights at uh, civil rights activists around the country saw. Um, when you realize that they are acting as a gang, they're kidnapping people. This is a mafia. The protest started at two o'clock. Um, the one that everybody was at at Federal Plaza, um, and then maybe there were some speakers, and then maybe 15, 20 minutes into the walk. Um, there was a guy being arrested for help, trying to help another girl. I found out later. He was trying to help another girl um, who was getting pushed around by police. And then he ends up getting arrested. And he sits in jail for 12 hours for trying to help a girl. So it's just, it's like, it'd be different if they were like violently like assaulting you, whatever. Okay, you, you can get arrested. But if it's the fact that I can say majority of the people at the, at the recent protests have been peaceful and they've been arrested for it. And that's not, that's not fair, that's not just in any way, shape, or form. They didn't read my Miranda rights, but they said that I was probably going to be charged with aggravated battery. Um, because they said that anytime you do, you like touch a police officer in any way, it's aggravated battery. So even if it's like uh, just spraying water on them, that's technically aggravated battery which is a felony. And so I didn't know what was gonna happen to me at that point. They, they probably, it was probably like about 12 hours that went by or more before they told me they were gonna charge me with disorderly conduct instead. When I got released, the curfew started at like eight o'clock and I didn't get released until 3 a.m. I had lost my phone at some point during the protest. They took off my shoe when they were zip tying me, they took off my boot. So I only had literally like my clothes and one boot. I probably would have had to walk about 70 blocks to my grandparents' house on the south side because I didn't know how I was gonna get home. Like that, that was the only thing I could think to do was just to walk until I got to my grandparents' house. Um, I didn't hear from Justin until maybe 30 hours after he had been locked up. I had been waiting outside the 18th precinct where I, I was first told that he was for the, the prior 24 hours to that. So I was just standing outside that precinct. I had, there was an attorney outside and I gave him my phone number just in case if I walked away from the precinct and Justin came out, he could talk to him and, you know, relay it for him to call me. And so that's how I actually ended up talking. And that was the first person that I talked to or that Justin talked to when he came out was the attorney. And the attorney called me, told me he was out. And I, obviously I rushed over there to get him at that point. I didn't get in touch with my family until 3 a.m. though because I went across the street and there was a lawyer out there with snacks and water and he, uh, he um, asked for my name to Justin Cosby and uh, it was kind of funny actually because he said Justin Cosby and I was like yeah he's like you're Justin Cosby the famous comedian and I was like famous because <laughs> uh, he called my brother and he was and my brother was like dude you're famous like everybody's using your name like like dude everybody knows who you are I was like what and I didn't believe him at first, I thought he was completely exaggerating. I was definitely kind of like one like, kinda, like an attention high, I guess, because I had never received that much attention in my life for like anything that I'd ever done. Um, so I, I was definitely like, you know, I was definitely like satisfied hearing like people were telling me like, hey Boogie posted about me, like uh, Janae Aiko, like uh, Dream Doll posted about me. I'm just like, what? And then it was something like I'm famous. Like, I saw, he, first thing he showed me was like, it said Justin Cosby on the hat, like the hashtag on Twitter had like 90,000 tweets. Immediately I had hopped on social media, which is one of the, I've come to find out, it's one of the most powerful influences that we have in today's world. I, I was actually humbled to see people were just as terrified as I was because this is like real, like they're really kidnapping people. And 
but yeah I got people also have people followed me so I kind of took on this responsibility of posting updates because Justin wasn't the only prisoner that they kidnapped and yeah Justin gained like a following like I know his Instagram like tripled in followers and stuff I was like it's really humbling to see y'all like really care about this the same as I did the social the amount of support and for Justin and I see for me and me Jahan um, was amazing we got so I, I can pull it up I got so many texts I thought that was the coolest thing ever um, it's just that was the one thing that I was really that really like was the highlight of this is that how strong how well this community came together to help find Justin and, su and support us as a whole uh, this is uh, everything that we're doing here. That's proof that we have power. That we have power to change the community. People are changing the lives. You all changed my life. Everybody's calling. Everybody, people are calling me a hero. I'm not a hero. You guys are all the heroes. Every single one of you. Every single one of you that come together for the greater good to fight injustice. You are the hero. I want to tell you all that. Thank you. You all helped me get out of jail. Woo! I don't even know how to really thank everybody who. Who did it? Um, who donated money? Who reposted me? Who like called them? Just like put so much pressure on them to for my release? Because who who knows? Like if they didn't put pressure on them, I don't know when they would would have released me. And so because of what people did, because of what people did for me, um, that enables me to have a platform to do the same thing for other people. Like I know I know one of the first things I do when I, when I when I go for any money transfer students, I'm gonna get a car. I'm gonna be at protest, bailing people out. I mean, getting people. Um, home after they get out of the precinct because I know how important that is. Don't don't just sit on the sidelines and just let it happen. You know, even if it's something just as recording it, just finding out the person's name so that you know where they're going, just keeping tabs on them. We just gotta keep tabs on everybody who's getting who's getting detained because we don't know what the police are doing with them because we the thing is we just can't trust them anymore. When you do something that becomes an iconic symbol of standing against oppression, you you end up bringing people together. Like e even though you're suffering, um, it's something that, that can't really be undone. Um, and I do think about it a lot. Like I'll just be randomly like doing something, and I'll just you know, I'll just think about um, what the police did to me. Mainly the officer who stepped in my face and like just smiled at me while he did it, um, and just how they made me beg for food or water to use the bathroom. The first thing that I wanted to do was like just let everybody know I was okay. Cause I don't want people to like, keep worrying about me. Um, Cause the police had already like just said so many horrible things. I just wanted everybody to know I was okay. Then from there, I was just more focused on like making sure everything was in place for like proceeding with legal action against the CPD. Cause this shouldn't happen to anybody else. The fact that like what they did to me um, could probably could have killed somebody else. I mean, the problem was definitely the abuse. It was. That was just the start, the abuse, the neglect, just, you know, the fact that they're supposed to protect and they do the opposite, they instill fear, they work like a gang, if anything, I mean, the problem is more so with the institution than it is the police, because they were built to do what they're doing. You can't just deprive them of their rights and not give them anything they ask for and keep them in jail for however long you want just because you don't like what they did. Um, you, you gotta understand that we have a legal system in place for a reason. We have we treat people a certain way for a reason. And when you don't do these things, it, it looks bad on them. And then they wonder why people are calling to abolish the police, people are calling for their jobs. And it's that exact reason. It's the fact that we can't trust them, the fact that they're not, they're, they're doing their job in a way that is hurting the people they're supposed to be serving, which is a thing we keep on going back over.
I basically support the like abolish the police or defund the police um, because Chicago puts all this money into um, the police department if they restructure it and take all their money out of it or it takes at least a good majority of it and put it to things like education mental health um, drug uh, abuse recovery um, that could really I feel like that could be something that could truly improve our communities um, not only in Chicago but in all the major cities so that's why I think I think that could be a real thing um, a real tangible thing that can happen that could actually cause change this country spends so much money on po police institutions they spend so much money Chicago individually I read a statistic this morning. I think it was 33 million dollars that spent on p keeping Chicago police departments in Chicago uh, public schools 33 million dollars in an institution that's in debt right now. There's this quote which says, you treat people, um, people will become what they're treated like. So you put billions of dollars into police officers, they come into these marginalized communities. In Chicago's example, they come to these Chicago public schools and they treat these kids like criminals. What are they going to become? They're going to become criminals, right? You're paying police officers essentially to come and destroy the very communities that they're meant to protect. The thing is, the cops, what they do to people is breaking the constitutional rights and every time you every time you break citizens every time you violate citizens uh, constitutional rights there should be backlash for that so even something like if it's the right to live then you should face backlash from that you should be in jail We don't need an organization that's going to treat people like that, that are going to treat citizens like that. And the police need to either understand that if if they don't change their culture, they don't change the way that they serve people, that there's going to be retaliation on this part of the citizens. There's going to be um, backlash for that. We can't keep putting taxpayer dollars into people who are going to terrorize our citizens. Don't be afraid of these people because without their gun and their badge, they're just like a person, just like just like me and you. I remember a police officer had pushed, I put my hands up and a police officer pushed me with his baton as hard as I could. He's a grown ass man, I'm a teenager, he didn't even budge me. I'm, I'm just, I was just thinking like, dude, like, you, you know, like this is just a power grab, like, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm putting my, I have my hands up, I'm not threatening to you at all. He takes his baton, just rams it into my chest. It's like, why was that necessary, dude? Like, do you, you think that your six weeks of training justifies you hurting people? It doesn't. There's so many countries um, where crime is so low that the police officers pretty much don't have jobs. And we can, we can be like that in America if we all, if all of our citizens work towards that. We've already made so much noise about this. Like we've already, we have two, like in the first two weeks, we already have like 400 plus videos of the police being brutal to people. Uh, if we just keep chipping away, if we just keep this steam up, we, there's no telling what can happen. Everybody in, in line, on the same goal at the same time is what's giving this movement the momentum that it has. This is the, the biggest civil rights movement that's ever been, ever. It's bigger than the ones that we read about in our history books. We're living through something right now that's bigger than that. Uh, we reached a boiling point. Uh, I, I touched on it earlier, but um, I grew up in the social we all grew up in the social media age and in the social media age you're li you're having a live you're living you're living uh police brutality you're having a live look you're seeing videos you're seeing there is no longer deniable before our time uh police brutality there's always in there there was always an excuse because they weren't caught on video they couldn't put it on twitter it didn't go viral on twitter now we're live looking we're live living the experience and as black people with this triggering traumas from past generation so you've got we've been on this country we've been in this country for 401 years now and you've got the traumas from slavery traumas from Jim Crow and segregation the traumas from police brutality we've reached a boiling point this is the last straw um, I don't want to I don't want this for my kids my grandkids my net my nieces nephews my little cousins I don't want this to be a reality I don't want them to be 
desensitized to seeing black men, black women, um, black trans people being killed on a regular. That shouldn't be something that we should see this often in the media. Um, and it's just, I, and the main thing that I think is different is that we have our phones and we have social media and it's really powerful. It's really, really powerful. And if we can use it the right way, I feel like that plus protests, plus organized conversations, plus visuals, everything, I feel like we can really stir up conversations um, within our own communities to make a uh, physical change. Just, just think, like, if it was somebody you know, or if it, you know, you don't deserve to go missing for 31 hours. You don't deserve to be out of contact with your family for a minimum of 27 hours when I finally got my phone call for spraying the police with water. You know, just, just, just think as a family human being, I'm just thinking about how other people um, interact with the world in comparison to how you do. Um, just have empathy for them. What I saw was an entire community nationwide uh, dedicated to the liberation of this one black boy uh, because the Chicago Police Department, one of, to me, one of the most corrupt police departments in the country has kidnapped a black boy. So it gives me hope because I'm like, if the entire country could rally behind this one uh, black boy, imagine Imagine the magnitude, imagine what all would change if we rallied around our black women the same, if we rallied around Breonna Taylor, if we rallied around every single injustice that's happening, realizing that these are not isolated incidents. Oh, she didn't, re she didn't comply here, he didn't comply there. Now we see that we're going to be targeted for our skin color no matter what. If we ride for all these black women the same and we ride for, that we roll for Justin, or we ride for everybody the same and we ride for Justin, it gives me hope because I'm like, we see our power. That's just that's just a tiny little fragment of the power we have as a collective. Um, while I was at the protest in Chicago uh, a few weeks ago, I was beaten and detained by the police and they didn't let me uh, talk to my family for about 31 hours after that. Um, the thing is that what the police did to me, uh, if they did it to, anybody, to somebody else, um, it's possible that they could have been killed. Um, they withheld food and water from me. They withheld my, uh, they didn't even uh, let me go to the bathroom for a while. Um, the thing is that we, we need to end the way that police treat people. Uh, it's not right for anybody to um, be treated that way. And the fact of the matter is it wasn't right when they did it to me. Um, every single individual in this crowd today who is here, it could happen to any single one of us. Um, unfortunately it happened to me, I was singled out being a young black man um, and the thing is that it was exactly what I was fighting against. When I got out of jail and I had seen that people um, had made a huge social media uproar over my uh, release, um, I, knew, I knew that what I had done was doing the right thing because in, in protesting the unfair treatment of the police on the general populace, especially black people, um, we found another example of unfair treatment uh, by the police. And it only, it only makes my uh, points for speaking stronger and it only uh, makes my voice stronger. Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, in doing so, they only made my voice stronger, they only made my, um, my will to fight against oppression stronger. Um, that's all I have to say, uh, thank you. In the land of the free and the home of the brave, I have come to realize who is the free and who is the brave. Justin Cosby getting thrown in jail for protesting is the brave. But if the jail cell he inhabited for 31 hours and over 60,000 of his African American brothers and sisters wallow away in every day is any sign, then they are clearly not the free. When I see videos like this, videos that we've gotten all too accustomed to seeing, it makes me think, how did we get here? Contrary to what we're often told, slaves and slave masters are not our ancestors. The people that experienced Jim Crow and the people that signed and enforced Jim Crow laws are not our ancestors. The people marching on Washington and boycotting in Birmingham were not our ancestors. These people were our grandparents and great-grandparents. 
The dark history of the United States isn't as far in the past as we are taught to believe. Realizing that modern day police departments are derived from the slave patrol of the 1800s, how can we expect anything different than what we get? Understanding all of this made me think, what's the purpose of the police? If you ask Britannica.com, they're responsible for maintaining public order and safety, as well as preventing and detecting crimes. If you ask the Charles Scochin Institute, its purpose is to promote public safety while upholding the rule of law, making it so individual liberty can flourish. Trust and accountability between the police and the policed is essential to advancing these goals. It says that the police do have the power to exercise force, but they must do so in the way that protects the rights of the community and upholds rule. It says proper policing requires that law enforcement builds positive relationships with their communities, respects civil liberties, and avoids tactics that encourage using force against citizens. If you ask me, I sure hope that they're doing something wrong. Following Justin's release, I saw people in my community of all different genders, races, sexualities, classes, professions, and ethnicities unifying to fight injustice. The truth is, while Justin did make a great heroic sacrifice, he's not a superhero. He's just a guy that wants equality. We all have the power to use our voices just as loud as Justin did. And if Justin can change a whole community in just 31 hours, imagine what we all can do together for as long as we need.